All right, welcome everybody to this session on evolutionary ecology, especially adaptation. Um, our first talk today will be given by Andrew Beckerman. He will be telling us whether phenotypic plasticity can aid adaptation. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to start the session off talking about phenotypic plasticity, particularly predator-prey induced, predator-induced phenotypic plasticity, and whether it can aid local adaptation. This is work that has been done in my lab, particularly by Martin Lind, who is a postdoc with me, but also Mauricio Carter, Kylie Yarlett, and Julie Rieger. And if none of this really makes sense, the details can be found in the proceedings paper that's linked to it. I'm going to be talking about predator-induced phenotypic plasticity. And phenotypic plasticity, for those of you who need a bit of a refresher, is the ability of a genotype to produce more than one phenotype to match the environment they're in. And a classic example of this is in predator-prey interactions, particularly with Daphnia. You can see Daphnia 2. These are the same genotype. These are twins. This one's been raised in the presence of chemical smells from fish grows spiky bits on its head, and this is the same genotype, it's twin, but grown without those smells. Classic example of predator-induced phenotypic plasticity. I work in a system of Daphnia here in the UK that experience two predator regimes. They are experiencing predation from midge larvae, K. arboris midge larvae, um, and or from fish, stickleback fish in particular. Um, this is the artificial system we create in the lab. That's the control where there's no risk of being uh, predated upon. But keep in mind that there are two big environments out here in the UK, those dominated by the midge predator, which likes to eat the small Daphnia, and the fish predator that likes to eat the big one. A little bit more introduction to the system. I work specifically with Daphnia pulex. It's a small Daphnia. It also grows a less charismatic spiky bit on its head when it's scared, particularly by the midge larvae. But today I'm going to be focusing mostly on a number of life history traits that respond to predation risk. The life history traits are the size and age at maturity, adult growth rate, and reproduction. I'm focusing on these because these form the core bit of theory that underpins our understanding of size selective predation. And again, as I mentioned, fish like to eat the big Daphnia, and that generates typically an investment in growth over reproduction. The midge larvae likes to eat the small Daphnia, and that typically generates investment in reproduction over growth. Okay? These are the life history concepts that underpin size selective predation. There is the added bonus that under the midge predation regime, there are little bits of morphology that grow on the head to increase survival but we won't be spending too much time on that today. So it's a Daphnia system, classic example of predator-induced plasticity. We've got a number of traits that respond to the presence of smelly water from either the fish or the midge, generating these patterns. The question that I'm focusing on, that we focused on in this research, is whether or not phenotypic plasticity, this ability to change the phenotype within a generation through altering development, puts the phenotype somewhere special. And in particular, whether it puts it on the line of least resistance on which selection acts. So this talk is actually about the phenotype, but also about some genetics. And I'm going to focus in on plasticity, on something called G-max, which is this line of least resistance along which selection acts, and then the selection gradient, how the animals are being pushed along. Some definitions just to keep you up to speed. Plasticity is this induced change in the phenotype. So compared to control, what is the change in these different traits that we've measured when they're exposed to the smelly fish water or the smelly midge water? The G matrix is a pattern of genetic variation and covariation. In this matrix is an estimate of the heritability of the various traits, 
as well as genetic trade-offs or constraints, which are positive or negative relationships among these traits at the genetic level. G max, when you have more than one trait, is actually the first principal component of this pattern of variation, and it's known as the line of least resistance along which selection can act. Selection gradients are a way in which to evaluate how fitness, reproduction, and survival, the combination of the two, respond when the various traits change, when various traits in the population change. I'm going to give you some data on all of these, and then we're going to move into evaluating the ultimate question, which is formed of two parts of theory from a paper by Paul Draghi and Mike Whitlock. The first idea is that all of these changes that can happen due to predator-induced plasticity may align the phenotype with this major axis of genetic variation. So here's a cartoon with three traits. Here's the phenotype that moves from control into some other space caused by the predators. And we ask whether or not these changes align with where the line of least resistance is, so the green line here. Is the phenotype, in that sense, put in a position where it can be pulled along by selection or pushed along by selection? The second bit is whether or not that plasticity aligns with the selection gradient. Is the phenotype in a position that actually needs any pushing, or does the phenotype end up where selection would put it, which is one of the big ideas about what phenotypic plasticity might actually do if it's adaptive. This theory comes from a paper where they, simulate, they simulated how plasticity might evolve, and these two patterns emerged from that, and we thought we've got some data that might allow us to evaluate that. So let me walk you through the data we've got, and then ultimately this, ultimately this question about whether these three things are aligned with each other. The whole question here is about the alignment of these vectors, whether or not the angles between them are close to zero or really far apart. Okay, it's a very simple idea graphically. So this picture has the evidence that we have lots of plasticity and genetic variation in the plasticity. Here are the three traits that we've measured, adult growth rate, age at maturity, and size at maturity. These are known as reaction norms. Each one of these lines is a different genotype that we've measured. Each of these labels here corresponds to the environment in which we measured the phenotype. The solid line is the pattern across this population, across and am among these genotypes, and there is lots of plasticity and genetic variation in the plasticity. Selection can possibly act on it. Here we have a picture that corresponds to overall what the pattern of phenotypic plasticity is in the fish or the midge environment. And what I want you to realize here is that midge and fish predators push the animals in different directions. That's what this big angle means. They go to a different combination of traits and a very different space of the phenotype. So plasticity definitely happens, and the animals move into very different places depending on the predator that they are experiencing. This picture is known as a subspace. I like to call them donuts because it's breakfast time still. But basically, these capture the pattern of the G matrix, this pattern of genetic variation and covariation among traits. We have three axes here. The important thing is that the size of the donut represents genetic variation, and the orientation of the donuts represents the pattern of the major axis of variation. And the key message from this, on top of the last one, which is that there's plasticity, is that the pattern of genetic variation changes, and in fact, the line of least resistance is different when they're exposed to these different predators. Fish actually rotate them towards reproduction and adult growth here versus the midge here. Okay, so what we're seeing is a shift not only in the phenotype, but the underlying pattern of the line of least resistance along which selection can act in the Daphnia. This picture is about the selection gradients. Slightly abstract, possibly to some of you. Let's focus in here on the R, that stands for reproduction. S stands for survival, okay? What these show is the pattern of selection measured against reproduction as fitness or survival as fitness. What you can see here is that in the context of reproduction, whether they're in the midge or the fish environment, everyone's trying to reproduce more. However, when we think about survival, selection gradients can look like this. 
being big in one condition or being small maximizes survival. And that's what this orthogonal pattern represents. Now, I'm going to tell you some truth right now. This is measured. This is made up. It's very hard to measure the survival selection gradient in the lab with the Daphnia. I will come back to that in just a little while. When we put all this together, the plasticity, or in particular, the G matrix, which is the heritability and covariation, and the selection gradients, we can actually predict the response to selection. And this is the response to selection for age, size, and adult growth rate, the three traits, under the fish and the midge conditions. I don't think it's surprising that we see differences based on these because the selection gradients look different, but more importantly, those G matrices look different. How selection can act is structured by that variation and covariation generating these responses. The top line here is the reproduction, the measured stuff. Here's the made up one, and here are some combinations in between. And the take home message here is that selection happens. This is the response to selection, the change in the traits. It goes in the way we would expect from theory, with adult growth rate changing a lot more with fish, changes going down here versus up here. But the really important thing is that no matter how we add these real and made up ones that map onto the way life does work for a Daphnia, we get roughly the same patterns, slightly different magnitudes there. Okay, so what I've showed you up to now is that we have phenotypic plasticity, the traits change, age at maturity, size at maturity, growth rate, and reproduction. I've shown you genetic variation in that, and that the phenotype is very different for these two regimes. I've also shown you that we've got this pattern of genetic variation, this line of least resistance, and that also is different. That means when selection acts under these two predator regimes, things go in very different directions. And then there are the selection gradients. The ultimate question was whether or not those patterns were aligned with each other. And here are the comparisons to share with you. If you look at the top row, this is the fish condition. Here's plasticity and whether it's aligned with Gmax. And the answer is yes. Here's plasticity aligned with one aspect of the selection gradients. And the answer is yes. Here we have a bunch of no's, but there are some yeses. So this is one environment, one treatment, the fish. And we get some corroboration of this alignment question. We also see that there is evidence of alignment in the midst treatment as well. However, plasticity does not align with a phenotype with Gmax, but it does align under multiple conditions there. The overall picture is that there is quite substantial evidence for alignment being able to happen, but also some missing gaps here. Why didn't we get this all the time? And this brings me to the take home messages I want you to have from this talk. There is substantial plasticity, regime-specific G matrices, and all traits respond to selection. We can get alignment. Plasticity appears to be able to facilitate this pushing and pulling. This idea of adaptive plasticity might actually be true. However, there are constraints and trade-offs and patterns among these traits that seem to matter and make it impossible to always see what we might have expected from theory. But the reality is that we didn't actually measure everything possibly that we should have and could have. We didn't actually measure survival, selection gradient for survival specifically. It was too very difficult to do. And we've also left out a very important trait, this morphology. So overall, I think there is evidence that plasticity can align the phenotype and influence and create the situation where we expect plasticity to be mapped on to the way selection operates. Getting it right, however, requires that you measure the right things, and also keeping in mind that the phenotype is actually a rather complex thing involving a lot of different traits that are quite challenging to measure. Again, most of this work is presented here in the proceedings paper. Thank you very much. really interesting, thanks. Uh, I was just wondering if you have any idea of what would happen if both midges and fish are present, what G matrix would look like, and if phenotypes still align with Gmax in that case? It's a good question, and so the answer is we do have data on what happens when both predators are around, and 
one of three things happen. Depending on where the genotypes are from, they either ignore fish or ignore midge or find something intermediate. And we get all three of those patterns. Um, that pattern of variation, genetic variation, covariation, moving across those populations um, definitely would influence this. Um, the natural history of the system is that you get fish and midge coexisting or midge alone. So it's actually a very important bit. But we do the experiments on those two treatments, mostly. All right, thank you. Let's okay. thank Andrew once more. So our next speaker is Filipina Ferreira. Love the Dutch sound, which I rarely get to pronounce, and now probably didn't prop do properly. Anyway. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Um, it's always good to be here. Um, today, uh, so my talk will focus on adaptation to climate change. So how do plants adapt, really? And is there a possible role for epigenetic variation in here? So the classic theory of adaptation, um, we know that adaptation is governed by genetic processes um, as a result of so, yeah, natural selection on the phenotype. Um, so this process of adaptation strongly builds on the idea that phenotypic variation is actually uh, genetically based. Uh, and for a long time, genetic variation was actually the only uh, known source of phenotypic variation and thereby important for evolutionary potential. But we now also know that other processes may also be involved, such as uh, epigenetic processes. So very shortly, what are epigenetic processes? Um, epigenetic processes, a well-known described mechanism is DNA methylation, and that's the um, addition, the, or actually methyl groups are attached to the DNA, and because of these, these groups, these molecules, uh, genes are expressed differently, they may not be transcribed. So basically, um, based on how many and where all these methyl groups are on your DNA, uh, different, your genes may be, well, some genes may be expressed, other not, so you may result, you may get different phenotypes. And the interesting thing of these methylation patterns is that um, these are strongly uh, affected actually by environmental conditions, um, such as temperature or um, rainfall or whatever. Um, so this actually may provide an additional pathway um, for adaptation. But is this really happening? I mean, this is in theory, this is very interesting, but do we find such patterns in nature? So we had a unique opportunity to test this in a long-term climate change experiment, the Buxton climate change experiment, um, this was being set up by Phil Grime and others in 1992, uh, and also Jason Fridley. And um, basically, on this, uh, in this experiment, which is a calcareous uh, grassland on a hilly slope, uh, different climate change scenarios were, we, were applied, focusing on um, drought, summer rain, winter warming, and the uh, combined treatments. And what they found was actually quite remarkable because it turned out that these calcareous, this calcareous grassland, the species community, turned out to be relatively resistant to these climate change treatments. And this is, of course, then, you know, raises the question, so how, how does this come? Where does this resistance stem from? Um, what determines the capacity for these, this community, these plant species to evolve so quickly? Scabiosa columbaria, it's a little for here, um, is one of the plant species which occurs quite abundantly in all plots and has shown some great resistance to these climate change treatments. 
But although it is everywhere still after more than 20 years, um, there has been some strong phenotypic differentiation um, um, in response to the different climate change treatments. For example, plants in the winter warmer treatments were much smaller than in other treatments. Same, we found some patterns, very strong patterns for um, flowering. So this is very interesting. And then, of course, you would like to know um, how stable are these patterns and are they possibly genetically or um, epigenetically based? Well, and till, well, recently, I would say, it was actually very expensive to apply to measure both genetic and epigenetic variation uh, using next generation sequencing uh, in ecological studies. It was just uh, too expensive, at least it was for us. Uh, so we worked on a method, uh, what we call EpiGBS, um, where we can now measure on a relatively cost-effective way um, both DNA methylation and genetic variation in exactly the same um, fragments, in exactly the same sequence reads. So we can now actually uh, do high throughput um, uh, comparative analysis of both genetic and epigenetic variation. So when we got measure, start measuring our plants in, or some of the plants in the Buxton field site experiment, so these are about 100 plants and the genetic, uh, there's a genetic tree and don't try to look at the details because it's a quite um, horrible picture. Um, but you see all the different colors, and these different colors, they represent the different climate change treatments. And what's the main message of this slide is that there is actually no clustering, no genetic variation in response to these different climate change treatments. We then looked at the epigenetic variation, and these results are still a bit preliminary because there are only about 48 plants included, but still we do see that although there was no genetic differentiation in response to these climate change treatments, we did find some um, ep well, evidence for epigenetic differentiation. So you see clearly that the plants from the control treatment, so the green dots, that they nicely cluster, um, followed by the plants from the summer drought treatment in orange, and then followed by, well, some plants from the winter warming, well, and actually the plants from the winter warming and combined summer drought treatment, there's no real clustering at all. But there is some evidence for epigenetic clustering in response to these climate change treatments. So this is very interesting. And then we wanted to know whether these phenotypic and epigenetic differences we observed in the field site, whether they were still there and remained stable when you transplant them to a common environment. So in 2013, we transplanted plants from the field site to a common garden experiment in the Netherlands, and we followed the plants over time. First phenotypic variation after one year, after two years, and what you do see is that the phenotypic variation which we observed in the field site remained in the common garden. And the same actually for the epigenetic variation. So again, we found some clustering for the green dots, the plants of the control treatment. Now also for the plants of the um, winter warming treatment and the summer drought treatment. And again, no clustering for the plants of the combined uh, treatment. So now that we know that these phenotypic differences and epigenetic difference that we observe both in the field or in the field side they remain stable in the common garden that of course does not tell you anything about adaptation so to test that we set up a parallel experiment to test for the effects of adaptation and whether epigenetics could be involved in that so we collected seeds in 2013 from the field site from the control summer drought and summer rain treatment. These seeds were germinated um, and grown under control conditions in the lab in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Wageningen. Um, and at flowering, we crossed these plants with other plants from the same original climate change treatment. So we basically, we simulated a within treatment cross. 
And we call this the reset generation, and we did that to sort of control for direct maternal effect, uh, for example, by seed provisioning. And then these seeds were then germinated again, and the plants were then grown under control and drought conditions. We also um, demethylated half of the plants, so we basically experimentally removed many of those methyl groups, um, so we reduced the amount of epigenetic variation to test whether epigenetic variation could possibly involve in this um, drought response. Well, and we found very strong evidence for transgenerational adaptive effects to drought. So in this graph, if you look at the uh, orange lines, you see the F2 offspring um, of the so the plants of which the grandparents received is, or originated from the summer drought treatment uh, at the Buxton field site, and they clearly were able to tolerate drought much better than the plants from the <coughs> control and the summer rain treatments. And these effects, they were all, which was quite interesting, are all mainly driven by below-ground biomass, so by the root system of the plants. And then, when we looked at the demethylated plants, became, well, even more interesting, we think, because here we find no transgenerational effects at all. So the transgenerational effects that we found in response to drought we were not there, they were not able, no, yeah, they were not there anymore in the, in the demethylated plants, which could suggest that epigenetic variation is indeed involved by these adaptive responses. So if we all take this together, so, the re so we had an experiment where we had about 20 years of exposure, or more than 20 years, to different climate change treatments. We did, no f we did not find any genetic differentiation, but we did find some indications for epigenetic differentiation. This epigenetic differentiation remained after transplantation to the common garden, and we observed some strong transgenerational inheritance of these of adaptive responses to drought, but these were not found in demethylated plants. So altogether, we think that for this plant species, Cabiosa columbaria, the epigenetic variation has indeed helped the plant species to adapt to these climate change treatments. Finally, yeah, I would like to thank, of course, our funding bodies and um, University of Sheffield and Syracuse University um, for using the great experiment at the Buxton Field Site. Any questions? I think we have some time or not? Well, <clears throat> uh, if you know the genome, of course, it's, it's much easier. Um, but, um, yeah, you can, uh, I mean, we, 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 of course, we, you can blast and, and find signals for functional identities or GEO classes. Uh, so you can really um, go all the way, try to find some evidence for that, that the meth methylated groups are actually involved in promoter regions or whatever. Um, but but for, for this particular species, uh, because there's no, we don't know the whole genome, um, it's, uh, yeah, we, we probably won't go in that detail, but it is, it is possible with this technique. Yeah, well, I, I worked for this species for many years, to be honest. 
and um, um, it, it is uh, one, yeah, I, when I uh, met um, Phil, Phil Grime, and we see the uh, experiment, already, I already knew that um, this species responds very strongly in terms of epigenetic signals and changes and patterns in response to environmental conditions. Um, and because this species is, well, it is a very, well, characteristic uh, cal calcareous grassland species, so it's, it's every day in the plots, um, which uh, for us it was quite logical to, to go for that species. But um, to, to do those, you know, studies on, on this level of uh, detail, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's not that great always to work on a non-model species. Um, but has also very good sides. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid we we'll have to move on. Thank yep. you. All right, our next speaker is Matthew Christmas. Thank you. Hi, yep, so um, exploring genomes for evidence of climate-induced selection in Australian plant species, or the alternative title I've given to this talk is Go the Way of the Dodo, which might need a little bit of explaining, but I'm not going to be talking to you today about the uh, iconic ground-dwelling, now extinct, dodo bird. Instead, I'm going to be talking to you about this Australian uh, shrub species, Dodonea viscosa. And after studying it for three years in, during my PhD, I came to affectionately call the dodo. So Dodonea viscosa is thought to have originated in Australia. Um, it's the center of its di diversity, but is dis dispersed across the globe, uh, both naturally and as a result of um, human activity. Um, and its seeds can remain viable in seawater for extended periods of time, which has aided this sort of global dispersal. Uh, interestingly, it does occur on the island of Mauritius, so sometime in the past it would have coexisted um, side by side with the dodo. In terms of its Australian distribution, um, it's found over much of the continent, in the southern sort of temperate regions around here, um, as well as the subtropical and tropical regions, and also into the arid zone, into the centre here. And across this whole range, it's got a wide variation in leaf morphology. So why Dodonea viscosa? Well, when I began my PhD, I carried out a, a literature review, which um, is now published in Conservation Genetics, to consider how plant species may respond to contemporary climate change. And I really considered three overarching options which are open um, to plants. So plants can migrate across the landscape via seed dispersal to stay in line with their preferred um, climatic conditions. They could also adapt in situ by remaining where they are through a number of mechanisms. So gene flow from other populations may introduce adaptive variants into populations that selection will act on. There may be standing genetic variation or the occurrence of new uh, mutations, which may provide some adaptive um, yep, some, uh, for selection to act on. And then thirdly, within this in situ adaptation, there are these epigenetic and plastic responses, which the previous two speakers have um, talked about in some detail. Or the third option is that they don't respond at all, and that's going to lead to population extirpation and eventually extinction. And so I was interested, um, basically, in how a widely dispersed species um, may utilize these mechanisms to um, continue under a future changing climate. So first off, I considered um, migration. And this is in plants largely dependent on successful seed dispersal. And Dodonea viscosa has clearly been successful at this in the past, as we can see by its global distribution. And just considering its um, Australian distribution, if we look back over the past 21,000 years, back to the last glacial maximum, Australia's climate has altered um, considerably in this time. And during glacial times, 
Uh, there was more widespread desertification in the continent um, with higher aridity in the centre. And temperate regions were very much restricted um, to these far south, east and west corners of the continent. And these areas have been recognised as biodiversity hotspots and probably acted as refugia of temperate species during times of glacial maxima. And we can see evidence um, for this in the modern um, contemporary distribution of Dodonaire viscosa and the genetic patterns that I've identified across its uh, range. So here I used a restriction digest method to genotype 67 individuals um, at 941 single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And I performed genetic clustering analysis, analysis um, to identify genetic differentiation across this range. And these colored circles or pies, pie charts are representing assignment to these different genetic clusters. And they demonstrate the presence of geographically isolated clusters that may be the remnants of or expansions um, and expansions from these historic refugia. So these are the proposed areas of refugia during uh, the last glacial maximum. And we see um, corresponding genetic clusters within these regions, which may be um, obviously yeah, and then expansions from these into the more arid zone. So migration seems to have had a role to play in the persistence of Dodonaire viscosa under historic climate shifts. But what about now? Well, since the first European settlers arrived in Australia in the 1700s, the continent has experienced wide-scale land use change. And there's large areas that have now been cleared um, for agriculture. And that's represented by these orange areas on the map, which largely overlaps with Dodonaire viscosa's range. Um, and so this clearance has left many isolated uh, fragments of native vegetation across the landscape. And so migration now be, may be largely hindered by this fragmentation. And if you add to this the almost unprecedented rate of climate change we're currently experiencing, um, this figure basically shows that under a business-as-usual carbon emissions um, scenario, by 2070, no part of Australia will have an environment analogous to what there is present on the continent today. And this is represented by this purple shift. So the more purple the country is becoming, the more different it's becoming to what there is available today. And so even if species can migrate, then migration isn't going to be enough because the environment is going to change beyond what they're adapted to. So migration will be constrained by habitat fragmentation and a rapid rate of change. How about the alternative um, option of in situ adaptation? So in order to look at this in Dodonaire viscosa, um, I looked at a small part of its range in South Australia called the Adelaide Geosyncline. So Adelaide is around here on the map, which is um, where I live. And this in area includes two significant mountain ranges. You've got the Mount Lofty ranges through here and the more northern Flinders ranges as well as an island at the bottom, which is Kangaroo Island. And it encompasses a very strong environmental gradient, with it being cooler and wetter in the south, and aridity um, increasing as you head north. So several studies have now uh, focused on the phenotypic variation in Dodonaire viscosa across this same region. And so, for example, it has been shown that there is a decline in leaf width uh, with, latitude, with a de decrease in lat latitude. Uh, similarly for specific leaf area, we find a similar pattern. And also with an increase in mean maximum temperature, we see this increase in martial density on the leaves. Um, yeah, so we, so we know that um, there's these phenotypic patterns, but what I was really interested in, in getting to understand was the um, genotypic variation across this range and whether Dodonaire viscosa demonstrates genotype environment associations along this environmental gradient. And so in order to do this, um, the first thing I did was to sequence the leaf transcriptome of the species from leaves from natural populations. And this prov provided me with a functional representation of the genome. I assembled, the annotate, assembled and annotated this genome, uh, the transcriptome, and this was published in this BMC uh, article. And then I used this transcriptome to identify a set of 970 genes that I wanted to target target um, within my, the, my population samples. And these 970 genes were genes that we identified that may be potential uh, targets of selection across this range. Uh, there was a number of different categories for that. And then I used this method called hybrid capture target enrichment to specifically ta um, target those genes within my populations. <coughs> 
So I sampled 17 populations across the range, represented by these colored dots, and five individuals were collected per population. And the first step was to assess the neutral genetic diversity and structure in these populations. So using 815 um, SNPs, uh, I identified three distinct genetic clusters. So we've got this blue Kangaroo Island cluster in the south, we've got this eastern cluster, and then we've got this Flinders Ranges cluster. And this was quite interesting and perhaps a bit surprising that what looks like a continuous distribution on, uh, on the mainland has these distinct genetic um, clusters. And the blue Kangaroo Island cluster is probably a result of isolation from these other populations. But this clustering here required some more explanation. And a couple of potential explanations for that is that what we're observing here is isolation by environment. So these um, samples, up, these populations up here are very environmentally close to each other, but um, gene uh, ge sorry, so geographically close, but environmentally distinct from each other. So there's a big rainfall uh, drop-off to the east of the ranges. And yeah, all alternative is that these red samples are the sort of the edge of a expansion from the east, and we're looking at a contact zone between these different genetic entities. So it was important to get this measure of genetic diversity because that was fed into the subsequent analysis of looking for genotype environment um, associ associations. So in this analysis, we um, analyzed 8,462 SNPs distributed over the 970 target genes. And firstly, we looked at these outlier SNPs, which using this program called Bayscan, and that identified all SNPs that were displaying greater differentiation than expected by chance. And then we carried out two genotype environment association analyses using LFMM and BAYMV2, and these were looking for significant associations between the SNP variants and the environment. And by environment, we were mainly talking about rainfall um, and temperature. And so this graph is the output from the BAYMV2 program, and it assigns um, Bayes factors or probabilities of SNPs um, significantly associated with environment. And so any SNP with a log 10 base factor of greater than 2 is showing a real strong signal of selection, of being under environmental selection. Um, okay, and so then we focused on the ones that were common across all of our um, methods, which came to, we came to this 50, um, yeah, 50 um, significant SNPs. And we looked at the function of the genes that those SNPs were found in, and there was a number of um, functions that are related to responses to the environment. So in particular, we've got this response to water deprivation, or genes that are involved in responses to water deprivation, having over, th um, there was over 30 of those genes present within our, our, um, our gene set that had these significant SNPs. To take a specific example, um, this graph shows um, the allele frequencies of a SNP within this calcium-dependent protein kinase gene plotted against the temperature and rainfall composite, and you can see the low frequencies correlate with um, this composite. Um, and calcium-dependent protein kinases have been shown to play important roles in rapid abiotic stress responses in plants. And it makes sense, that, therefore, that different variants of this gene may be selected for along this gradient, with the northern populations experiencing greater abiotic stress. So just to sum up, um, We've demonstrated that there's this clear population genetic structure across this part of its range, which may be the result of a combination of isolation by distance and environment, or we may be observing a contact zone between different range expansions. We've got this strong genotype environment associations in a number of SNPs across um, several genes, and this is suggested of selection and local adaptation. However, a causal link between the phenotype and the genotype is still yet to be made, and that, obviously that's a, a, a matter of ongoing work. And overall, there appears to be high levels of standing genetic variation um, across these populations. And this provides plenty of raw material for selection to act on in the future um, as the climate changes further. And this puts Dodona Nova Scosa in a good position to adapt and persist under climate change. But the question still remains as to whether this adaptive genetic variation will be effectively distributed where migration and gene flow are hampered by this um, highly fragmented landscape. Okay, so in conclusion, Dodo and Eviscosa probably won't go the way of the Dodo anytime soon. And I'd just like to thank um, the lab group, um, particularly my um, supervisor for this, Andy Lowe, and my co-authors, Ed Biffin and Martin Breed. Thank you.
of, of, what, of re reproductive isolation. Well, I mean, we're talking within the same species, I, potentially over the long term, but I, I don't think, expect that to be the case now. But if we think about those distinct eastern and uh, Flinders ranges, ones that have come from um, separate parts of the continent, potentially, that they're, they're, if, if the environments are great enough, then of course that might force reproductive isolation eventually. But this is such a widely dispersed species that inhabits such a wide variety of environments that I doubt we're going to, it's going to lead to reproductive isolation um, in these populations. Thank you. Can't see the mouse anywhere here. <laughs> But it's, but yeah, it's sort of the wrong screen. screen. Okay. Yeah, if you don't know how to, how to switch it. So the mouse just doesn't appear here. Oh, here it is. Yeah, it's just oh, okay. I see. All right. So yeah, let's just close this presentation. And the next one. So we go to the folder. All right, so sorry for the delay. So, wait, where do I go full screen here? <laughs> Perfect. No, so, perfect here, but not there. Oh, no. What happened? I don't know. I don't know. I think we, there's a function here to change. Uh, mm. You know, to see here and there, and perhaps. Um, yeah, I think we'd be at F8. Yeah, I don't want to touch mm. it. see it here, but uh, okay. Oops. All right. But now you can't see it here. Yeah. 
that's it. If you just do it that way. Okay. That way. Um, so we can we can see the, the, the whole screen with the control L or something. Uh, it's weird. Looks like the presentations are working well, but that's it. Yeah. But it's huge. Oh, it's still cutting it off, isn't it? in a PDF and not PowerPoint. Um, PDF? None of the others have been in PDF, but um, right. have you got have you got the PowerPoint? If, yeah yeah that'd be that'd be good if you have. So, how much time do I have? Just five minutes. Five minutes, okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's see. Um, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone.
Uh, I'm Xavier Picot from uh, Doñana Biological Station. Uh, I have been working uh, with Arnal Marce from CREAF and Carlos Alonso from National Center for Biotechnology for a long time now. And today I'm going to uh, ex expose uh, some of our results on uh, studies on adaptive evolution in life cycle phenology in Arabidopsis uh, thaliana. So life, life cycle phenology can be defined as the suite of events spanning from seed to seed. But there are two transitions that stand out from the rest, given the impacts of these transitions on fitness. Seed to seedling transition, including uh, seed dormancy and seed germination, which are completely <coughs> different uh, uh, processes, taking into account the physiology of these, of these processes, and the vegetative to uh, reproductive uh, trans transition. There are tons of uh, papers and literature uh, dealing with, uh, with, this, uh, with these issues. However, we know two important things that strongly determine the way we study adaptive variation in life cycle phenology in plants. The first one is that the evolutionary implications of variation in life cycle phenology cannot be fully understood if its components are considered in isolation. And we have good examples of this because uh, we know that uh, the timing of germination strongly affects the timing of uh, reproduction. And we also know now that the environmental conditions during flowering, fruiting, and even dispersal do affect seed dormancy patterns. And the other important fact is that the interplay between life cycle phenology, the genetic basis of uh, fitness-related life cycle traits, and the agents of natural selection actually are not homogeneous uh, across the space in time. Actually, they are quite heterogeneous, and this is why this is uh, why it's so difficult to study and understand adaptive variation in life cycle. So, what do we do to uh, to work with uh, and to study uh, adaptive variation in life cycle phenology? Since uh, early 2000s, uh, we are collecting seed from natural populations in the southwestern Mediterranean basin, which is one of the hotspots of genetic diversity for this uh, for the species. So uh, to date, we have uh, more than 450 populations, and every year we add new populations to the, to the collection. I have to say that uh, for this collection, about 60% of the populations occur in wild environments, whereas the other 40% are, can be found in locations with a variable uh, level of uh, human activity, which is the difference with the Arabidopsis thaliana growing elsewhere. So what we do is to phenotype this, these populations, we genotype the, these, uh, these populations, we multiply the seed, and we prepare the materials to carry out uh, evolutionary studies. So one of the things that we do is to quantify the genetic variation in life cycle traits. Uh, here you can see how seed dormancy, which is uh, estimated as the SDS50, which is the number of days required for a genotype to germinate at a rate of 50%. And you can see how seed dormancy uh, decreases with, uh, with uh, excuse me, decreases with, uh, with uh, altitude. And uh, for the sake of clarity, because, boy, are you serious? Okay. For, for the sake of uh, clarity, uh, here I'm, I'm showing the mean values among, among populations falling within each uh, uh, altitude interval. You can see that heritability values for, for seed dormancy are, are pretty high. The same, oh, excuse me, the same is done for, for uh, flowering time, which is the number of days uh, between the opening of the first flower and, uh, and uh, ever since uh, seed germination. And you can see that we, can, we, can, uh, we get the opposite pattern. So seed dormancy and flowering time are negatively correlated. The point is, is this correlation constant across time? It's not. Here you can see how the correlation coefficient between dormancy and flowering time, uh, uh, it's actually different along temperature uh, gradients. Interestingly here, what we can see is the turning point from which the relationship between seed dormancy and flowering time cannot increase any further. We interpret this as a, as a boundary in the, in, the, in the possibilities of the organism to keep adjusting 
uh, a life cycle with increasing temperatures. At this point, plants early very flower, flower very early, excuse me, and produce seeds with uh, high seed dormancy. If we um, place this, uh, these populations onto a map and we differentiate the populations below and, uh, and above the, uh, the turning point, you, we can see that cold environments, Arabidop in cold environment, environments, Arabidopsis thaliana has uh, late flowering and low seed dormancy. And in warm en environments, just the opposite uh, pattern. So, Shafir, if you can just go to your take home. Slide. Yeah, but, uh, you know, well, anyway, it, it's a technical problem. It, it wasn't my problem, right? We agree, right? Well, yeah, I know, I know, but, uh, but anyway. Uh, one of the good things uh, to working with Arabidopsis is that uh, we can study the, the genetic basis of these, uh, of these traits. You can see the number of genes we are dealing, so uh, we, we face really, really challenge. And what we, did, what we do is, this, these are uh, key messages, what we do is to sequence these key genes of central regulatory pathways so uh, we can see that functional, poly, functional polymorphisms, yeah, well, anyway, functional polymorphisms of key genes occur at low frequency and account for limited variance in, in quantitative traits. Another example, and, and here, for example, the, the, the point was that in cold environments and in warm environments, we have a strong variance in life cycle phenology, which seems to be accounted for different regulatory genetic mechanisms. And well, this is what we are doing, and uh, you know, acknowledgements, collaborations, and uh, thank you very much. So maybe we can take one quick question uh, while we are changing the presentation. Okay, so if you want to. an issue again, I'm so sorry. It's technology, yay. Okay. Right. So that's a PowerPoint, so it should work. Oh, okay, cool. That's I just, fine. it's not showing up there, that's the... I'm Elisa, I work with Gabriel Yvonne de Rocher, and I look at, I use the tools of experimental evolution and oceanography to figure out how large microbial populations adapt in complex fluctuating environments. Specifically today, I'm going to talk about how a marine diatom Thalys pseudonana evolves differently in environments that fluctuate on different timescales. Now, you could ask, and quite rightfully so, why use Thalys Sira for your experimental evolution if you could as well use bacteria which evolve a lot faster. The reason for this is mainly the great ecological importance of these organisms. So we know that, oh, that doesn't, oh, no, sorry. Um, I can't get the point out of work, sorry. Ah, I can. So, sorry, so oceans that are rich in diatoms are often net carbon dioxide sinks, which is good, whereas oceans that are often more rich maybe in coccolithophores do not act as a carbon dioxide sink. So diatoms are really, really important for biogeochemical cycling, particularly with regards to carbon dioxide. They are also at the real, at the right, right at the foundation of um, ocean food webs. So small things eat diatoms that then get eaten by larger things. And eventually, if anything happens to the phytoplankton foundation of the food web, it's going to have repercussions up at the higher tropic levels. And eventually, it's going to affect the things that are fluffy and that people actually care about. 
the organism that we're using kind of looks like this, um, if you use, yeah, or, or like this, actually, if you ask Google. And we all know that worming actually poses a real problem for many reasons, one of them being that, at least in the short term, predicted changes in net primary production are for net primary reproduction to go down. So today, this is our ocean, and the kind of reddish regions are the regions where organisms photosynthesize a lot. So we get a lot of oxygen into the atmosphere, a lot of carbon dioxide taken out of the atmosphere and put into the ocean. Whereas future predictions say actually net primary production might, as the sea surface temperature increases, it might go down, and that wouldn't be so good. However, it's not only warming that we need to be worried about, there's also variability, and that could be variability in the environment and variability in the responses of organisms to the environment, and technically those two, we should study them in concert. But in order to stick to the timing today, I'm going to talk about variability in the environment only. Now, as for temperature, there has been, oh, as for temperature, there has been ample theory and ample experiments showing that as temperature increases, usually some kind of measure of the rate of performance also goes up at first until it reaches a maximum and then it drops off. However, this is for a linear increase or just one change in temperature. It doesn't really tell us a lot what happens if environmental conditions as temperature, for example, go up but also change. Because then we don't really know if organisms react by shifting their curve and if it's going to make them better or if they just shift the curve but they don't have this increase here or maybe they make the curve broader and they lose out at the peak. We do not know these things. So basically what we don't know is what happens on evolutionary timescales and whether or not there's a cost associated in terms of not having the high peak performance anymore. Now, it has been, these things, they have been subject to extensive modeling. For example, in this model here, that is looking at the frequency of fluctuations with regards to the generation time. So here we have short fluctuations and long fluctuations there, and then environmental predictability <laughs> along here, selecting for very different strategies. So usually, if you have, for example, long fluctuations and low predictability, you'd respond by adaptive tracking, otherwise maybe by being phenotypically plastic, so by using the same genotypic basis to create many different phenotypes. Furthermore, the amount and variability of fluctuations is also really important for other um, aspects like evolutionary rescue. So for example here, we have a small change in the environment and it's highly predictable. And we see that evolutionary rescue goes its normal path, right? The organisms struggle, but eventually they get better. However, if the change is large, but the fluctuation is also large, so low predictability, the population just plummets and there is no rescue to be had there. Experimental evidence is really scarce, and I'm just going to say quickly that this is using fluctuating environments in dark gray and a stable environment in light gray, and you can see that for all the different environments that these organisms have then been tested in, growth rate is always higher in the fluctuating environment, pointing to the fact that evolving in a fluctuating environment maybe selects for a very different approach than evolving in a stable environment. This was done on bacteria, which is really good, but in order to be able to translate this to what is happening in the ocean, we actually have to do an experiment using ocean critters, which is what we did. We got our organism Thalia cicera pseudonana into the lab, made them clonal, and then grew them in three stable environments, 22 degrees, 26 degrees, and 32 degrees, and then importantly, we had two fluctuating environments. One that was fluctuating every four to five generations between 22 and 32 degrees, that should select for plasticity, and then another one that was fluctuating between 22 and 32 degrees every 40 generations, which is kind of mean because it's too short for them to actually track the environment, but it's a little bit long for a plastic response. Then we went a little bit crazy, and this slide looked a lot nicer as a PDF. I'm sorry for the errors obscuring things, and we measured pretty much everything that we could think of measuring. Today, I'm only going to be talking about growth rates and the thermal dependence of photosynthesis. In terms of growth rate, what we have here is the weeks of the experiment carrying on growth rate along here, and this is data up to 300 generations of evolution in the selection environment. 
Now, what we can see immediately is that these squiggly lines are different lengths, and the shortest one is at 26 degrees, the longest one is 32 degrees, so at 32 degrees it took them the longest to evolve in that environment. And if we look at this in more detail, what we see is that actually, in the beginning they used to be really quite happy, but then the population plummeted, and only after about 100 generations evolutionary rescue kicked in and they finally established a fairly well-growing phenotype again. But we know from the other phenotypic data that these samples are still really stressed and actually not, not the happiest of samples. Another environment that I would show you, would like to show you in a bit more detail is the environment that had the long fluctuations because here what we get is divergent responses. So again, this is time, growth rate along here. Then we have the circles for 22 degrees and triangles for 32 degrees. What we do see is that with time, all of the samples evolve higher growth rates. However, there is one subset of samples that really likes the 32 degree environment, 22 maybe less so, and then another set of samples that is really happy at 22 degrees and maybe less so at 32 degrees. However, both of them are still a lot happier than they used to be in the beginning. Now, this is on the level of the bioreplicate. If we want to know what happens on the population level, we can either do whole genome sequencing, which is what we did. However, the data is at the moment in a format that isn't really presentable. So what we have instead is the clones that we picked of these populations and then assayed them at a number of different temperatures. What we see is that growth rate variation is really low across bioreplicates in the short fluctuating environment. Actually, the variation that we see here is on par with what we find in the stable environments, and this means that indeed we have selected for highly plastic phenotypes rather than populations that are made up from a mix of different specialists. There is a little bit more variation in the FL environment. You can see some of them are, depending on the temperature that they're being tested in, quite different from each other. And also what this tells us again is that we have differently preferred environments across bioreplicates. And if they are in the environment that they prefer, so this is 22 degrees here, there is very little variation. And again, in this case, that's 32 degrees. And we can find again that within population variation is really low. So we can then go a little bit more crazy. And rather than doing a reciprocal transplant, test our samples at a range of temperatures here from 15 to 40 degrees Celsius and measure growth rate here displayed as the log growth rate. What becomes immediately obvious is, is that all of these growth curves for the samples from the different selection environments are quite different from the 22 degree sample, right, which just goes like this and falls off. We see that all of them broaden their curve and in most cases this comes at no to, to small costs um, compared to the 22 degree environment. So Particularly in these, we see that they become a lot flatter. However, they are a little bit lower than the 26 degree samples. And this is quite interesting because on average, these samples here do see 26 degrees, right? This and this are the extremes, but this would be their average environment. Interestingly, even though they resemble in shape the 32 degree environment, they do a lot better. And so what we are thinking is happening here is that they evolve to the most stressful environment, which would make a lot of sense, right? They experience 32 degrees occasionally, and it is the most stressful environment of the two, but they do get some respite at 22 degrees occasionally. So the shape resembles that of the stressful environment. However, they do better because occasionally they do get to take a breather in the nicer environment. Yep. And again, we have the broader curves here, but for quite different reasons. As I said earlier, this one here is mainly due to the organisms being really plastic, whereas here we have two different populations, one of them preferring the colder temperatures and the other preferring the hotter temperatures. Um, yes, evolution is happening, which is good. We know what happens to things that do not evolve. However, it's not very surprising because large microbial populations have, high, have a high potential to make an evolutionary response. Slightly more interesting, maybe, is, the, is one of the underpinning mechanisms, which frankly looks like confetti. So I am going to cut out the respiration, and I'm going to focus on the photosynthesis um, itself. And also, I'm focusing on the fluctuating environments compared to the mean environment. So what we have here is assay temperature and photosynthesis along here. And again, we can see that the curves are actually 
broader than they are um, in the stable environment. And this does not come as a trade-off in the short fluctuating environment, where generally per capita rates of photosynthesis are higher than they are in the stable environments. We do see that in the environment that fluctuates over longer term scales. We also see that the curve is broader, but only in the really stressful environment does it come at a benefit. So to sum up, our mechanistic underpinning in this case, photosynthesis matches quite nicely what we see in the growth rates with the broader curves and the hotter, more stressful environment driving evolution, which is actually in line with other studies that have found that if you've got multiple stressors, it's usually the worst stressor that's driving the evolutionary trajectory. Yep, but different for different reasons, and the costs are at least in the short fluctuating environment quite negligible. We see a similar pattern if we look at isolates that we've taken from natural communities where also organisms from the hotter environment, and here a very hot and variable seasonally, seasonally variable environment, are a lot higher than in the environment that's colder, which kind of means that probably these should never escape the lab because they're going to take over the world. It's also important for modeling because models are usually based on mean predictions and temperature, not on the noise or the variability in that. And with that, I am done. I'd like to th thank um, Gab and his fantastic lab and you for listening, and I'll take any questions if there's time. <laughs> So, if possible, we can take one question okay. while we're changing the sure, presentation. Sure, sure, sorry. If, if I take it longer, I'll just take this off. Yes. Okay. Okay. When your population decay initially in these experiments, and how long did it last? So, we only saw decay. Oh, sorry, when did it start decaying? Yes. When did it start decaying? So, it took about two weeks for the decay to kick in, and then it remained for about 100 generations at that level, and those 100 generations took about a year, a year and a half in real time, which is quite interesting because our happy populations in that year, they grew 1,000 generations, nearly 900 generations, so it took them, it took them a while. How do you interpret that the stress didn't hit them until two weeks or so? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I think it's because maybe in the beginning they can't help growing faster because temperature makes things go faster. And maybe by doing that, they accumulate photo um, oxidative damage or other repair mechanisms can't catch up so that they just accumulate the damage from growing too fast. Or maybe it's some Or I guess my question is, does this accumulate across generations? Does it accumulate across generations? Was this several generations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, two weeks would be about 14 generations, so they do they do okay in the short term response, but yeah. We also see that in the thermodependence curves, right? That if we put the organisms that have been evolved at 22 degrees and we test them from 15 to 40 degrees at 30 degrees in the curve, they are still not on the ground that goes down. They're still fine. All right, thank you very much, Elisa. So our next um, presentation comes from Dimitrios. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk a bit about my uh, PhD research. So to start from the beginning, we know th there's a lot of literature that shows that climate change will affect the dynamics of whole levels of biological organization by directly affecting the metabolism of individuals. Uh, therefore, if we want to get a better understanding of how um, biological systems will uh, be affected by climate change, it is best to, un to investigate how key metabolic traits uh, will evolutionarily respond. And this can be done within a framework of thermal response curves. So as you saw in Elisa's talk, um, these, if you take a biological rate of an ectotherm and uh, measure it across a range of temperatures, you typically get a unimodal uh, curve. And various parameters of their shape uh, vary across individuals, populations, or species. And we are really interested in the processes that generate variation in the shape of thermal response curves because there is literature that suggests that uh, mismatches between interacting species in the shape of, the, in the shape of their curves uh, can exacerbate the effects of climate change. Uh, 
Now, one of the most important parameters uh, in these curves is the thermal sensitivity of the response, which can, measure, can be measured in three different ways. Uh, the simplest way is to calculate the slope uh, of the rising part of the curve, which I shall refer to as E. Uh, the second measure of thermal sensitivity is the operational knee width, uh, which is essentially the range of temperatures between the thermal optimum and the temperature at which the performance is half of the maximum at the rising part of the curve. And finally, the full knee width, which is the range of temperatures between the temperature of at half of the peak performance and temperature at half of the peak performance at the fall. Um, because the, these three measures are essentially different ways of looking at the same thing, uh, we expect some degree of correlation to be found within them. Um, the one thing is that um, to get accurate estimates of these three measures, we need different uh, parts of the curve to be well sampled. So for E, we need the rise of the curve to be well sampled. For the operational knee width, we need the rise and the peak of the curve. And for the full knee width, we need the whole uh, curve to be well sampled. And this is a problem because experimentalists typically measure the rise of the curves, sometimes also the, the peak of the curve, very rarely the fall of the curve. So for the rest of this talk, I will only focus on the first two measures of thermal sensitivity. Right, so the million dollar question is how thermal sensitivity evolves. Um, the classical argument in the literature, the argument of the metabolic theory of ecology, is that thermal sensitivity evolves uh, is very constrained by the underlying uh, enzymes, and therefore any evolution is minimal and purely random. The leading alternative hypothesis is the biochemical adaptation hypothesis, which suggests that no matter what environment a species lives in, uh, adaptation should be able to uh, maintain its peak performance relatively constant, and that would necessitate changes in thermal sensitivity. And finally, we can conceive of other intermediate scenarios where uh, adaptation can only partially uh, overcome the constraints set by the underlying enzymes. Therefore, to answer this question, uh, I did a phylogenetic meta-analysis of uh, published thermal responses of phytoplankton growth rates. And, well, phytoplankton are very important from an ecological point of view, but they uh, are also very good in that they have short generation times, which should, in theory, allow for rapid adaptation, and also for practical reasons, because to, answer, to test this hypothesis, uh, phytoplankton are one of the few species groups for which we have big enough physiological data sets. So my data come more or less from the literature. Um, essentially, people go to the environment, isolate phytoplankton, take them back to the lab, and then ground them under light and nutrient saturated conditions for a cross range of temperatures. And just to show you where my data come from, they come from really all over the world. Um, they are both freshwater and marine species. So once I have this data, I can then fit uh, mathematical models uh, uh, to them and get the thermal uh, responses. So uh, here you see a fit of the sharpest school field model on one species uh, in my data. So I fit these responses to each species separately. And if I have good RMSD, so a, a good uh, R-squared value, so an R-squared uh, of 0 0.5 or higher and enough data points to accurately get the estimates, I can then get estimates of E and the operational niche width. Um, you see the discrepancy here between the two numbers because, like I said, uh, not everyone measures uh, the curve all the way to the peak. Right, and like I said before, uh, if you uh, plot the measures of phi and the measures of the operational knee width uh, for the curves, so we can get both of them, uh, you see that there is a tight correlation between them, which makes biological sense because if you have a very uh, high E value, that means you have a very steep slope, and that would lead to a, uh, to a very narrow uh, operational knee width, and vice versa. Right, for the phylogenetic part of my work, um, I could not find the phylogeny that had all the species in my data set, so I had to build one. So I collected 16S and 18S RDNA sequences from GeneBank, aligned them with MAFT, and uh, estimated the topology of the tree according to maximum likelihood and Bayesian methods. The best topology was selected on the basis of likelihood and also the proximity to the open tree of life, which is essentially an attempt to um, get a consensus tree of life from a lot of published phylogenies. Uh, I also considered adding extra species to the tree, so terrestrial plants, macroalgae, just to see whether this would improve the quality of the tree. And finally, I, uh, op I assigned relative divergence times to the best topology according to the uncorrelated gamma distributed rates model. Uh, so 
pulling that, taking that all together. Uh, here you see uh, the topology of the phylogeny, and I have mapped uh, the estimates of phi on the, on the branches. So branches that are very dark red are species that have very high E values, so very thermally sensitive species, whereas branches that are white or yellow uh, are less sensitive. Um, the arcs around the circle correspond to the phyla, so if you see here, uh, the dark green species are the chlorophyta. And just from eyeballing this tree, it doesn't seem to, uh, no striking pattern seems to emerge, so you don't see a phylum that has only very high or only very low values. You really see a mix of both. And the same story can be said for the operational needs width as well. Uh, so to be more quantitative about this, we first decided to ask whether thermal sensitivity evolves in a random and constant manner. Um, so this can be answered with the node height test that you see here. On the y-axis you see uh, the contrasts of the values uh, of the trait uh, corrected for phylogenetic relatedness. So if two species are very close in the phylogeny, you would expect their trait values to be very similar um, and vice versa. And on the x-axis you see the position of the contrast in the phylogeny. So if the evolution was random and constant, we would see uh, no relationship between these two axes. Uh, the fact that we see positive associations in both cases indicates that, that the evolutionary rate has not been constant, but has accelerated, which is more or less relatively recent uh, in the phylogeny. And this means essentially that species are better able to explore the available parameter space in thermal sensitivity. And to really understand what is going on, uh, we also did a disparity through time analysis. So what this method does is it cuts the phylogeny from the root all the way to the present. And at each br branching point, it calculates the mean subclade disparity, which is essentially the variance uh, of the trait within the subclades over the total variance of the trait across the phylogeny. And the gray area that you see here uh, is the result of 10,000 simulations of a trait evolving randomly on this particular phylogeny, whereas the black line is the actual uh, observed uh, disparity in the trait. The fact that we see higher disparity than expected uh, near the present uh, for both traits indicates that there is a pattern of niche convergence going on, and different clades, evolutionarily distinct clades, uh, are able to converge on the same distributions of thermal sensitivity. So what can we get from all of this? Uh, first, we, we can say that the evolution of thermal sensitivity is not purely random as you would expect uh, under the metabolic theory of ecology hypothesis, but is constrained by a pattern of niche convergence. And a recent acceleration of the evolutionary rate allows species to better explore the available uh, parameter space and therefore uh, occupy more and more similar uh, niche space which is great news for phytoplankton because uh, it essentially means that no matter what your evolutionary background was, you should be able to adapt to your environment given evolutionary time. So the next steps that I'm going to do is try to understand how general this pattern is. So can we see this phylogenetic pattern in other traits like photosynthesis rate or respiration rate or other groups of species? So if you know any big data sets that I can use for this analysis, please come and talk to me. And finally, I would also like to model the evolution of thermal sensitivity among phytoplankton and trees using evolutionary invasion analysis. So essentially having a native, a resident uh, phytoplankton cell with one particular value of thermal sensitivity and then a mutant with a different one and these two try to compete in different scenarios and see what strategies are evolutionarily stable. So right, I would like to thank these people, thank NERC for uh, my funding and all of you for your attention. Your tree of all of those algae and stuff mm -hmm. um, that you built, is that just with the 16S gene? Yeah, it's just the 16S. So um, I, I, I don't know um, whether you can really fit those different clades of eukaryotic algae and know how they relate to each other very well at all. Um, so yeah, I just wonder about that really, because it's quite a problematic Right, so... First, I did check whether it was very, whether it was close to the open tree of life, and it appeared to be quite close, um, contrary to what you would expect under. Uh, I, I think what I'm getting at is, like, could you do it in a way that you looked more within those major clades rather than across 
all of them because I just think that the our understanding of that deep eukaryotic evolution just isn't kind of good enough to do like the right. full scale thing is what I'm getting at. Right. Um, well, the good thing of this method is that it starts from the root and goes all the way to the present. So at some point, it essentially be enters into the subclades, and uh, therefore. It, you could really start the the method here, and the pattern would be the same. But other than that, I also found relatively good support, statistical support for, especially near the present, for uh, a lot of parts of the, in the phylogeny. So all the black and gray circles that you may or may not see uh, are uh, circles where there is, was very good statistical support across all methods, and it was also consistent with the open tree of life. So. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Demetrius? So our next talk comes from James Whiting. All right. Thanks. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about part of my PhD into looking at evolutionary correlates of wild immune variation. So as soon as immunologists went outside, they noticed that com uh, in animals in the wild, compared to their laboratory counterparts, they saw this huge diversity in the way that animals in the wild respond to parasitic infection. This is because compared to the laboratory environment, animals in the wild have to deal with various stresses. So these are things like limiting resources, competition, uh, threat of predation, as well as having to deal with infection from different kinds of parasites at the same time. So these environmental stresses interact with uh, and expose the costs that are involved with immunity. So these are things like uh, resource dependence, autoimmunity through use, as well as antagonisms within the immune system itself. So as evolutionary biologists, what we're interested in is wondering how these various costs uh, mediate the evolution of the immune system in the wild. And so to do this, one of the questions that we can ask is how immune responses evolve in conjunction with other traits. So one trait that I've been looking at, or set of traits, are these life history traits. So life history traits represent a correlated suite of traits that are known to evolve in sync with one another. And we can make simple predictions on how immunity might interact with these traits. So for something with a shorter lifespan, the various costs involved with immunity may be offset, and so selection may favor a reliance on uh, immune mechanisms which are thought to be more costly. So these are things like innate and inflammatory responses. As we move along the continuum, uh, selection will favor immune responses which promote good health into later life and so are less costly. So these are things like acquired and T-helper responses. Uh, so put simply, something with a longer lifespan uh, would opt for something safe and dependable, whereas something with a shorter lifespan uh, may opt for something a little bit riskier. So we've been looking at these interactions in the North Eust stickleback system. So North Eust is off the northwest coast of Scotland. And stickleback make a really nice system for asking these kinds of evolutionary questions. Because uh, when marine fish invaded during the uh, previous glaciation, they were trapped in various locks around the, around the island. And so each of these locks, with its own environmental variation, creates a natural laboratory for evolution to take place. So with all this environmental variation, we see good immune variation between uh, fish from different locks. And we also have that uh, life history variation as well. So we have populations that are annual, short-lived, uh, longer-lived populations. And also we have anadromous marine fish which come, in to, uh, come inland to breed, and these represent the ancestral morph. So one of the nice things about doing this is we can look at uh, these associations within a species, so we can uh, c control for things like uh, unknown evolutionary history. And something else that's nice about this is that because radiations of stickleback uh, tend to show parallelism across the northern hemisphere, things that we find in this system we can actually look for in other systems around the, around the northern hemisphere. So something that we really wanted to get to grips with uh, when we were doing this study was this issue with measuring immunity in the wild. The fact that uh, phenotypes uh, labile and can be controlled by, so many phenotypes can be controlled by so we wanted to try and separate what was happening in a plastic sense from what was happening in a genetically determined sense. So to do this, we incorporated an aspect where we looked at stressed individuals uh, relative to less stressed individuals. And so in that system, that turned out to be breeding males. So breeding males stickleback have to build nests, they have to defend territories, they have to attract a mate, and then they actually have to rear the fry as well. And so they 
uh, exhibit extreme senescence towards the end of the breeding season, which is in keeping with the idea that these are really stressed fish. And so we also took uh, a more gene-based approach. So we looked at, a, we quantified immune response by expression of uh, functionally important immune genes. And we also incorporated a population genetic analysis based on some RADSeq data that we had from a previous sampling effort on the island. So our aim of the study was to ask uh, how immune responses are evolving with life history in the wild, with our hypothesis being that longer-lived populations should display less costly responses. And our study outline involved three, three main questions. Firstly, asking how these stressed individu individuals can modulate their immune response, whether immune responses vary between life history strategies, and finally, how much of that can be explained genetically. So straight into our first question, we looked at two locks over on the western side of the island, where we can find breeding and non-breeding males, and we did a two-by-two two sampling effort. From each fish, we took uh, spleen samples, from which we extracted RNA for qPCR analysis. We looked at, uh, we looked at commonly occurring macroparasites, and then we took various biometrics from each fish, including things like fat content, reproductive investment, age, size, and then we looked at the expression of these five genes here at the bottom, which represent different arms of the immune system. So to analyze expression, we did a multivariate analysis just to simplify the analysis. Uh, and so put simply, our, our principal component one is the overall expression of all the immune genes together. And then our principal component two is this uh, inflammatory component, which is shown by this increased expression of the inflammatory gene TNF-alpha relative to the other four genes. And so with regards to our question about what breeding fish are doing relative to non-breeding fish, we actually found uh, that breeding fish seem to increase their expression of the inflammatory gene TNF-alpha. And this was actually consistent about, across both of the locks that we looked at, even though there were differences between the locks as well. So bearing this in mind, we then scaled the analysis up to look at uh, breeding males across the island. So again, we've got our long-lived populations over on the western side. We've got our short-lived populations, which are here. And then further east, we've got our anadromous marine fish, which represent the ancestral morph. And uh, I should just say that geographically, whilst these populations are quite close together, we actually see very good uh, structuring across the island. So these are discrete populations. So we used the same multivariate approach, and conveniently, we got the same principal component axes. And so when we looked at our principal component one, so this is the overall expression of immune genes, we found that where the fish came from was the best predictor for uh, variation in this, uh, in this expression. And interestingly, what you can see here in the blue dots is that it's actually the short-lived populations that show the strongest expression of all of their immune genes. And so in our inflammatory component, we found that, uh, again, it was where the fish came from, which was the best predictor of uh, variation. And interestingly, it's the ancestral fish, so the fish that are coming into breed, that are showing the highest expression of this. So just to summarize the sampling, we should have our breeding fish increased expression of t uh, inflammatory TNF-alpha, and this is greatest for ancestral fish. So what might be happening is that we might have some terminal investment going on where autoimmunity is being traded off against uh, a, a single breeding event, or there may be sort of resource trade-offs involved in inflammatory regulation. But interestingly, this, uh, this idea that the short-lived fish had the highest overall immune expression is uh, something which I thought was really interesting, and it's something that I want to move on to now. So when we're asking about whether there's variation genetic, I mentioned that we had this RADSeq database from a couple of years earlier. And so we filtered this to look at SNPs that were associated in and around our qPCR genes that we'd analyzed. So this left us with about 55 SNPs. Uh, and we just did a, a PCA on this and found really good separation for our short-lived populations. Uh, and we couldn't really distinguish the other ones. So because we had this good separation for short-lived populations in terms of uh, genetic variability in SNPs, and we also had this good separation for short-lived populations in terms of relative expression, we took population means of uh, both of these analyses, and we actually found a really strong association between uh, allelic diversity around the regions where the qPCR genes were found, as well as their overall expression. So the strongest contributors towards this, uh, this genetic variability PC were around uh, FOXP3, which is a Treg activator. Treg processes can be immunosuppressive. And we also found uh, important SNPs around STAT4, which is a TH1 activator. So what's really exciting about this is the potential that there may be some kind of polygenic uh, architecture going on, which is underpinning uh, both the, the evolution to a short life history strategy and a divergence of the immune response. <coughs> 
So we also had a look around the rest of the genome just to see if we could find any other interesting genes that were diverged between strategies. And so I just want to highlight this. So this is, uh, this is EDA. So if anyone knows anything about sticklebacks, they've probably heard of EDA. It's always involved in the uh, adaptation from marine to freshwater. But from an immunological perspective, it's quite interesting because the protein itself has a TNF-alpha domain. And within the complex, there are various other inflammatory genes. So even